Good morning and welcome to day two of Streaming Media West Connect. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen, editor of Streaming Media and uh, conference programmer for Streaming Media West Connect. And normally we'd be meeting in Huntington Beach. But as we know, these times are anything but normal. I'm coming, for, coming to you from my home in Wisconsin, which along with the topic of this morning's panel explains the Charles Woodson jersey, carrying the G wherever I can. Uh, and of course, the upside of meeting virtually is that people who may not be able to attend in person or speak in person uh, can do so online. So we've got a great week of panels and presentations uh, coming to you the next couple of days. We had a deep dive into CMAF yesterday and we've got a look at WebRTC later today if you're into the technical side of things. And we've got panels looking at live streaming, ad tech and all manner of angles of looking at the OTT market, as well as of course this morning's panel on sports and esports. And things continue next week with the Content Delivery Summit on Monday and several deep dive technical workshops that you'll want to check out if that's your thing. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank our Streaming Media West Connect Platinum sponsor, Limelight Networks, and we've got a brief video to share uh, with you from Limelight. Steve, you want to play that video? At Limelight, we're in the business of connecting people to exceptional digital experiences. Our real-time edge platform has launched and grown some of the largest video properties in the world. When there's a high traffic industry event via the internet, the chances are we're helping deliver it. The difference? Limelight's global private network puts content and applications right next to your customers at the network edge. This result is the most dynamic real-time interactions, no matter where your customers are or what their business is. Like our network, we've also optimized our software stack to be fast, reliable, and secure. And our customers have unrestricted access to live regional technical support whenever it's needed. Limelight Networks has the capacity, the global footprint, and expert service worldwide needed to meet the growing demands for online content now and in the future. I'd also like to thank the sponsor of today's panel, Xilinx, and Xilinx's Sean Gardner uh, will be joining the panel today uh, along with our other speakers. If you have any questions during the panel, please submit them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window, and I will relay those questions to the panel uh, throughout the discussion and after the discussion, after the discussion is over. Now, as we all know, stadiums, arenas, public poker tables have been shuttered for six months for the most part. Uh, and even if they're playing, there's no audiences in the stands in most cases, except for, of course, college football. But we're not going to go there, are we? Um, but whether it's niche sports, esports, or sports related content that exists outside the games themselves, there's never been more of a demand for live sports content. And there's never been more live sports content available. And that's what we're going to focus on for the next hour. As I said, we've got a great group of speakers coming at it from all angles. And they're going to be led by our moderator, Jeff Jacobs, who's a bit of a legend in live streaming and has been streaming live sports, live entertainment uh, for years. And these days, he, uh, he's with a brand new startup uh, called Ven TV, which he describes as MTV for esports. So I'm going to pass things over to Jeff and let him take it away and introduce his panelists. Jeff? Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's our pleasure to speak today about uh, one of the most controversial, disruptive forms of content. No, of course, we're not talking about last night's debate. Thank you. We're, all, we're speaking, obviously, about uh, esports and sports streaming. And uh, today's panel uh, has a terrifically assembled group because, unlike sometimes in a lot of panels, uh, we've got a great diverse set of speakers today and panelists. Uh, We've got the, uh, I'm glad to say we've got the, uh, we've got the enabler, we've got the end user, we've got the creator, we've got the producer, and we've got the distribution and streamer. So we've really got the full diverse 360 um, food chain of esports and or sports streaming today. We're very lucky. Um, gentlemen, welcome. And again, as Eric said, thank you. Uh, let's go around the horn. Uh, tell us who you are and what you do. Let's go alphabetical order and start with Aaron. Uh, I'm Aaron Negler. I'm the co-founder of CheeseheadTV.com, which began as a WordPress blog that my dad and two friends read uh, 
over a decade ago and has grown into a digital brand. It's a, one of the most popular destinations for Packers fans on the internet. Uh, my co-founder is a legend in his own right in the live streaming space. He's been live streaming stuff basically since uh, the year 2000 and maybe even a little bit before. And those two passions of ours have collided and really for the last couple of years now really grown in that live streaming space. Um, it's, it's a digital lifestyle brand really more than anything else as these things continue to grow. Obviously, as we mentioned before, there's no crowds. So we're bringing that crowd feeling on the internet uh, for Packers fans worldwide. Welcome, Aaron. Sam? Great to be here. Um, I'm Sam Osvahani, CEO of OS. Um, previously, I was with the NBA for several years. I had the pleasure of crossing over with Jeff and, and working there. Uh, as a producer, developing their NBA 2K League offering. I uh, was the executive producer and head of content there for season one on the NBA's um, fourth league, as they like to call it. Since then, left and formed OS. OS is a um, industry-leading production agency. Uh, we are servicing the likes of the NBA, a vast amount of sports client, NFL, MLS, pretty much all the major sports leagues, uh, but then heavily into gaming as well with uh, publishers uh, such as Activision Blizzard, 2K, um, teams such as uh, 100 Thieves, uh, Minnesota Roker, Washington Justice, uh, and then more and more so brands that are really trying to understand how to um, activate with uh, online streaming and gaming. Um, we have a huge relationship with Anheuser-Busch, with Amazon, with Nike. Um, so a lot of that is how we integrate their brand and in an authentic way into live streaming uh, and the wider gaming world. And we are based uh, out of New York City. Welcome, Sam. Sean? Good morning. Yeah, Sean uh, Gardner. I'm the uh, market uh, development and strategy management uh, at Xilinx located here in uh, San Jose, California. Um, Xilinx is a semiconductor company. We, over the last three to four years, started what we refer to internally as a data center slash cloud uh, initiative, and, and have been working very closely from a uh, live streaming perspective mm -hmm. with uh, companies like AWS and, and Twitch and, and many others. And, um, our technology is, is interesting and different because what we focus on are applications where low latency becomes critical and also programmability. So all of the new technologies that are coming out, uh, things like AV1 are, are things that uh, we've been working on and developing. So um, yeah, as it relates to things like SRT and other web RTC, all of these protocols are things that we get involved in. So, um, yeah, very happy to be here. Thanks, Sean. By the end of this uh, panel, all I want to know in life is next-gen compression technology updates. <laughs> yeah, I don't all know right, what that means. <laughs> I, I, need, I need someone to explain to me what that is so I can sound smarter to the people in our company. Uh, there you go. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us, Sean. And last up, Tyler. I am Tyler Champley. I'm out here in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, the head of marketing for Poker Central. Uh, we run a... OTT subscription service app called Poker Go, which is uh, we do live tournament and other poker streaming events, uh, such as World Series of Poker. Uh, we run a studio here out of the Aria Resort and Casino in Vegas called the Poker Go Studio. It's basically a television studio and poker room. Uh, we do a lot of uh, TV show production out here for shows like Poker After Dark, High Stakes Poker. We do some esports events out of the studio, um, things along those lines. Put all that stuff up on Poker Go. And we also work with some linear uh, broadcasting partners such as ESPN, CBS, NBC, um, and they stream some of our events as well. Cool. Well, welcome, Tyler. And again, thank you to uh, Eric, Steve, and uh, Streaming Media West for the opportunities. Uh, let's jump right in with the, uh, let's jump right into this with the elephant in the room. Let's talk about um, remote streaming in the world of COVID. It's what everyone who is keeping their business afloat is a part of. Uh, there is, uh, there's a thousand different ways to slice the apple with, uh, pr with uh, remote production, uh, whether it's live streaming, whether it's live entertainment shows, whether it's broadcast production via live streaming. But most of all, regarding esports and sports content, 
in a COVID world. Tyler, we'll start with you. We'll go reverse alphabetical order. Um, everyone's been figuring out their workflow, what workflow is best for you. Um, I've been producing since March, utilizing one day it's vMix, one day it's Media Looks, one day it's TriCaster with Skype, one day it's, um, uh, you know, er, er, one day it's MVP, whatever that means. Someone asked me to try. <laughs> um, um, uh, Tyler, what's, what's your workflow of preference? How have you been getting it done? How's it been working out? It's been, it's been trying times with uh, most of our live tournaments that we usually uh, broadcast live have been postponed for obvious reasons because you can't have so many people in the same room or at the same poker table for that matter. Um, so we've been working closely with uh, the folks at the ARIA, with the folks with the Nevada Gaming Control Board, trying to figure out happy mediums and stuff. So for example, we're used to doing uh, eight-handed poker with no mass, obviously. Uh, that doesn't work in today's times, so we've gotten the okay to do five-handed poker, so we'll take it. Um, and then we've been trying to figure out ways to uh, to do it without the mask because that's also a Nevada gaming uh, requirement. Um, we actually uh, we actually came to a solution this past week where we've uh, we've hired a couple nurses and one of those uh, uh, fast results testing machines. And for our next live show, we'll be bringing them on site. We'll be doing some testing. We'll know within 30 minutes if everyone's good to go. If everyone's good to go, we'll take the masks off and we'll film as is. And uh, pretty much we'll be back to how we were uh, nine months ago. So we're pretty excited about that. That's going to be a game changer for us. Um, we've been doing some live shows over the past month with masks on. You know, it, it gets mixed bag. The interesting thing about poker is people like seeing the facial expressions and picking up on, on, you know, body ticks and stuff. Um, those are hard to see when you have a mask on. So I think it'll be much more exciting to the end user once those come off. Um, and, and it'll basically back to normal. The only thing that won't be back to normal is we'll still have to abide by the five handed rule. Um, but you know, that makes for a little bit faster poker. So we'll take that as well. Um, Tyler, clearly things are opening up. Uh, I was in California and I saw commercials for casinos here in New York. Also, the casinos are opening up with plexiglass and stuff like that. But, for, sure. but since March, have you done any remote production tournaments? Uh, and how did you get them done? We haven't. We haven't done anything remote okay. because, yeah, everything has been, has been postponed across the board. So we do, we do live events from Australia to, to England um, to Russia to all over the United okay. States and the events have been shut down everywhere. And if the events haven't been shut down, the other issue is uh, you've got poker pros flying into these events all over the world. And a lot of people have just been unwilling to travel, unfortunately. Yeah, that's uh, travel has been obviously the biggest uh, is why the marathons and the big concerts and, and, and uh, the international sporting events have been on hold. Uh, Sam, your thoughts about uh, producing, especially remote during these COVID times since March? Um, I think look, Tyler's right. It's been testing, but I also think, um, moments like this is what drives innovation. Um, an innovation that I think will stick around way after we go back to any new normal that we get. Um, so for us, it's been a little bit fascinating because of our sports and gaming background. Some of these workflows were already in our systems. The amount of remote production you do in gaming and esports, because there aren't really the budget to fly everyone to central locations every single time. So a lot of the times you are having a team in one city playing a team in another city. So some of the workflows had already been established. I think others have just been pushed and it's been fascinating to see the sheer amount of software and hardware that's been released in 2020 um, to support remote production. Us personally, Jeff, you already mentioned it. Um, we have a new tech NDI based control room. We can remote in and use a lot of that. So often we're having entire productions where we maybe only have one or two, normally an EIC uh, or a tech manager on site. The rest of it's remoted in. And a lot of what we've been using is vMix for our talent, uh, for bringing in their audio and video. We love, you know, we've really been enjoying vMix. It's obviously got its limitations from a limit of how many you can use per, per, per license and how you can string them all together. But ultimately, what I've found exciting, a silver lining to an otherwise very dark situation for, for not just our industry, but the country as a whole, it is the innovation that we're seeing. And then you, you mentioned so many that didn't exist last year in your intro to this question that have been released this year. So 
for for that um, uh, we've been we've been um, fascinated and are continuing to push uh, push the boundaries using uh, a lot of the systems that you mentioned. You know, it is almost Sam like a new product that, and we'll talk about what's going to stick later. But it is in fact almost like a new product a a streaming producer will be able to offer a client in the future. Hey, I need this produced. Give me a bid. Well, I can give you the I can give you the six hundred thousand dollar operation on site. I can give you the two hundred thousand dollar remote. Um, we'll talk about what's going to stick later, but it is kind of exciting and, as you say, innovative. Uh, so, so that's a big deal. Yeah, I'd I'd agree. One big thing that's happened to us is we were actually in the process of deciding whether we build a second control room in twenty twenty. So we have our new tech NDI control room, and just because of bandwidth, we were like, maybe it's time to build a second soundstage, a second control room. But actually, instead, we've been looking at cloud-based solutions to exactly your point, Jeff. The tier A go into the control room and the tier B at the lower budget points are their cloud-based solutions that mean we don't have to invest heavily on the capital side. So I completely agree with you. Huge, huge. Uh, Aaron Nagler, you've, uh, I, I spent some time on cheesehead.tv last night and um, <laughs> you've got like five networks on one page. You're, you're quite, quite, you're very, very busy. Uh, and it's a tremendous site. I really actually enjoyed it. Um, have you been, uh, I mean, I know you have been, uh, what's your workflow been for produ for producing in the cloud and or remotely? Yeah, I mean, we obviously are in a very unique situation because my co-founder runs a live streaming company. So it's something, it's an area we already were in. Uh, last training camp, we produced a live show each day after practice that was, I was sat in a chair in a house across from Lambeau Field, shot live, but cut and everything produced in New York City from our control room there. And that was last summer. So we were already kind of in this space, this remote workflow space. Obviously, March comes along, everybody has to pivot. Uh, our studio here in Manhattan had one control room and to what Sam was just speaking about, we built out three new control rooms. I mean, they're, uh, they're Remy's really, I mean, they're not full blown, but that's the environment we're in. And this past Sunday, you know, we have a, our live watch parties, which is something we did starting last year, again, kind of ahead of this kind of whole remote world we lived in. This year, we just went all in because traditionally I fly into Green Bay for the games. This year, Corey and I decided, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the middle of a pandemic to be getting on a plane every other week to go to Green Bay for the games. So he is in Green Bay at his home across from Lambeau Field. And I am in New York City in our studio and we are watching the games together. And one of the fun aspects, as Sam said, kind of a silver lining here, is the technologies that you are forced to either find or create around this. One of the things that we've, uh, that the company LiveX that kind of incubates Cheesehead TV has built is called LiveX Director, which allows people to basically see things together in real time at very disparate spots around the globe. Uh, so one of the issues we thought about early on was, well, Corey's going to be in Green Bay. I'm going to be in New York. We want to have the experience, like I said earlier, of being together with fans around the world, but we want to be able to watch the game together. Well, that's what LiveX Director did. It's milliseconds of uh, latency. We're almost watching it. It's, it's slightly off, but it's almost like we're in the room together watching the game. Um, and I've had so many fans reach out, you know, however, social, email, what have you, saying, I love this because of the fact that nobody can go to any games. So it gives the sense of inclusion, community. And again, uh, jumping off what Sam said, it's really been kind of exciting in the sense of you have to push forward. You don't have a choice. You have to be able to find these solutions to be inclusive, to bring people into your environment. Uh, at the same time, recognizing that it's a very unique situation you probably won't be like this forever so to speak there will be some kind of new normal when we come out of this but this kind of forced innovation has been thrilling to say the least and it's so funny besides all the technology that's coming out of it which is always good some of it's driven by necessity as we've seen in the past it's so funny how like and this is something i picked up in the olympic working in olympic stuff when i was with nbc sports years ago there the, we're enabling togetherness in a time when everyone's apart. I don't want to get all mushy, but, but what you're saying is you're bringing fandom back together uh, on behalf of the people and the sports that they love. A thousand percent. And, uh, yes. Yeah. And when I, before I joined Van about three, four months ago, I did a couple of global citizen concerts and we were really the first ones to get on the air. 
and we had brought people in, you know, most, you know, Elton John's backyard. We brought people together, uh, and, and it, was, it was so funny how the next day, it wasn't even about the, the entertaining factor or the technology factor from like our peers and geeks, in as much as everyone was just so overwhelmed with bringing people together. It's just such a funny thing. Um, and, it's, and it's a great byproduct uh, of what we all do for a living. Jeff, um, it's great that you mentioned that. I just wanted to give a shout out quick to that. that con those concerts were so instrumental in like, not only like you talk about bringing people together, it's so funny that my daughters talked about that. And that's like an aspect of streaming that they don't even recognize, okay, there's this huge technology play behind it. But that sense of community, they were talking to me about that concert the next day, not knowing like anything about how it was produced. And that's the whole point of like, I think what sports and esports that's the exciting aspect of all of this. Like, yes, it's horrible why we're here, but this idea that these technologies can like maybe find friends and companions and people who have like minds that you never would have been in touch with or never would have spoken to about, uh, that to me is the most exciting thing about being in this space right now. Yeah, musicians are a pain in the neck, stick with sports. <laughs> Fair. Go on. No, it's just the multiple tracks and the audio. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm hey, Sean, you are, in fact, the enabler. And everyone loves the enabler because yeah. you make stuff happen. You make stuff happen, and you're the most popular guy when things go wrong, and especially, probably in your case, when things go right. Tell us about what your company do has done. But again, we're, talking, we're addressing the elephant in the room, which is COVID. Tell us about what your company did to step up to enable producers like these during these times. Yeah, so I, I think... Probably, um, you know, a year ago or, or maybe even longer, we started looking at, you know, because we're also involved with things like 5G and with 5G comes an ultra low latency aspect. And so we could see that at some point there's going to be the ability to um, reliably have some kind of remote production and being able to um, do or, or virtualize some of the things that we typically have had in hardware. And so through uh, us directly and through partners, we, we started working on this, but it, it looked like it was going to be a long time ahead. So we thought, oh, you know, we'll keep working on it as things mature. Suddenly COVID happened. And, and I agree with everyone who's, who's mentioned this, that, that fundamentally, what we would have seen a technology adoption life cycle that maybe would have taken two years is suddenly now shrunken into months or at least a quarter or two. So um, from our perspective, th enabling things like, you know, kind of remote uh, cloud-based production is something that we've been working on. In addition to that, um, working with some of the, the large sports leagues and, and them wanting to be able to engage fans um, that's another big thing we're seeing going on right now, watch parties. But then what if we layer something like uh, micro betting or gambling, because there's many states now that are starting to, to open up in, in that area. And so I don't think we're, we're just yet there, but that's 100% ex that's where we're going. And, and we're, we're working with partners and other companies to put much of that infrastructure in place and where we get involved is either at the pixel level processing, making that happen in, in low latency on the networking side. It, and, and we also even do are getting involved in things like blockchain where people want the ability to, to add, um, you know, with esports, even we're seeing uh, things like blockchain, whether it be for distribution or for, um, for, you know, the ability to, uh, from a financial or monetization uh, perspective. Yeah, so we see a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in, in kind of many areas. Um, so you mentioned latency a few times, and, and every time you have a production meeting, you talk about latency. Sam, when you've done some of your remote esports the past six, seven months, has latency been a problem? It, it seems to be getting better and better. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely getting better. I think um, we're continually looking. There's there's two different um, types of latency that we're struggling with in esports. The first one is the um, the game, the competitive gaming side of it, the end to end, which obviously we have no control over. It's completely affected by the servers of the publisher, and how close to the servers and how much ping. That's something though you have to factor for in production from a storytelling standpoint. 
because it's something new that historically you didn't get. So that's the gaming side of it. Then on the production side of it, you're, you're absolutely right, Jeff. As things got developed, it's been getting better and better. Um, you know, the, the simple stuff, so being able to ISO audio and video as separate inputs so that you can, you know, do the sync yourself is, is, ver- is vital. Um, we all remember Zoom calls in March where there's like people are tripping over each other in the middle of a conversation. In you know, March? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even even okay, uh, even it's recently. That, but that's getting better. I also think it's two things, right? I, I'm a producer, not a, a technician, right? One, the technology's got better, and my my tech managers would talk about that for hours. But two, talent and on air talent is getting used to it, which is far more important to yeah. me than anything else. Which is they realize now the slight delays. We're doing more in rehearsal. They're, they're understanding it's not as easy. You don't see the body language anymore. You don't get the subtle taps to know when you're cued. People are like working harder than ever, both pro- talent producers and talent, to really like counteract some of these delays so that we're not just tripping over each other in the middle of a debate or a conversation, uh, which I think is something we are struggling with um, from like the fast paced conversation kind of shows. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, again, Sean mentioned how, how, how much better we're getting at latency. And I guess we've been seeing that every year. Um, if, if you're a CNN or a talk show or, uh, or even, quite frankly, a, a viewing party, um, you, you can deal with the half second, the second. But in, uh, in sports, when everyone's on a rem- eSports, when you're on remotes and you're playing each other, uh, it's impossible. Um, it's just imp- impossible to, uh, to have any sort of latency. Um, moving forward... Uh, we spoke about um, our production workflows in COVID times, uh, which everyone's experiencing, and we're all uh, making strides, uh, reaching our objectives. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, one day there will be a post-COVID. We touched upon very, very briefly on what will stick uh, and what will not. Uh, I think it's exciting that these new opportunities that some of this new innovative technology affords us. Um, I'll make this as brief as possible about eight years ago, maybe, when I was still at MTV Networks uh, working for Viacom, um, my world was always trying to get my production world into file-based production. Uh, we were trying to get off of tape so badly. And we were, and file-based was, was just normal already by then. And, uh, but we did have, but it's very hard to teach old dogs new tricks. And we had a lot of trouble getting certain departments from their HD cam tapes to file-based and digital <laughs> production <laughs> workflows. And it was really, really hard. Um, it was really, really tough. And then I, you may remember this, you may not remember this, you can Google it, it's the truth. There was a tsunami in Japan and it wiped out the Sony HD factory. And as, I mean, this is true, you could Google it. And the tsunami or the tornadoes or whatever wiped out the Sony HD tape factory in Japan and we were alerted by Sony that there would be a delay. And people were like putting HD cassettes on eBay. It was crazy time, this was about eight years ago. It was a crazy, crazy maybe 10 years ago. Uh, it was crazy time. And, um, and we went to all of our production groups and we're like, look, there's no tape now. You don't have a choice. You have to drag and drop this file to that little folder if you wanna get on the air. And, um, and the point is necessity put a gun to our head and made us um, change our production workflows point. That's what this has happened. Uh, that's what's happened here. Um, we all have friends at broadcast networks, especially or regional sports networks that have been trying to get Remy's done uh, for about, let's say two, three years. Uh, and everyone wanted to go Remy, Remy, Remy. Some people didn't know how, some people were hesitant. Uh, some producers felt it wasn't as creative and, they, and their job is to be the, the most creative. So, um, so Aaron, I'm gonna ask you, um, in this world of um, necessity driving uh, innovation and needs, uh, moving forward, what's going to stick? What more Remy's? I mean, now everyone's doing Remy's. They were reluctant, right. but now they're doing it because they have to. So where are we going with remote production in the future? Is it really an option now when everything gets fixed in COVID land and we go back to being America again, let's pretend spring, um, are we still going to have a bunch of Remy's? Are our executives going to say, "Hey, it worked for you last year. Why can't you do it this year and save me a few hundred thousand? Aaron, well, what's going to stick? Yeah, that that last point is the whole key to me because I think budgetary wise, it's just a no-brainer. The whole reason we did 
the remote I was talking about last summer was to as basically as a use case, a, a proving point, so to speak, when we went out to other clients and other brands and showed how much money we saved. I mean, you went from, in that remote production alone, we had, I can't remember how many cases, like 22, 24 cases, three producers. We went from that to, I think it was one producer and maybe six cases, you know? And you're just talking about, and that's before you get into travel, housing, all this stuff. It's just a no brainer. And Sean mentioned SRT earlier on. And I mean, that to me is the real kind of way forward because your ability as a producer or even as a talent member uh, to just send someone a link. I mean, think about how, how much more you had to do even five years ago to get someone involved in a broadcast. Now, literally everyone's sitting at home with their computers. You just send them a link and as long as they can get on Zoom, they can get on anything. You just have to, if you're on vMix, you're on Zoom, you're on whatever, uh, you can StreamYard, whatever platform you're using, it is literally as easy as sending someone a link. Now, obviously, more often than not, you're going to have to talk them through whatever standards you want when it comes to the broadcast itself and what you want them to look like, what you want them to sound like, this is acceptable, this is not. But ultimately, the ease of contribution, that to me is the biggest thing that's going to come out of all of this. The ability to literally, and we are doing this uh, with Cheesehead TV. I have people tune into my live streams. I do Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern from all over the world each and every single day. And every single day, people are asking, well, how can I contact you? How can I send something to you? Blah, 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 blah. How can I talk? Like, I want to know about this or that, the other thing. I literally send them a link and we have a private conversation like that. And that's not for broadcast, but that's connectivity. You can make it a broadcast if you want. Just add some lights and a mic and you're on your, on your way. So yeah, to me, it's the ability to contribute anywhere in real time. Uh, that to me, is that's the floodgate. Um, everything else is kind of aesthetics and how you choose to incorporate it. But more than anything coming out of this, it's about not just limiting yourself to whatever talent is available in your local area. Uh, it's about having, being able to be uh, contributing from anywhere in the world. Such a global connector, such a global enabler. Um, Tyler, I know you mentioned that you hadn't been producing remote uh, poker the past few months, but you've got to see some of these innovations, some of these tools and get excited as to other models, even, even weekly talk shows, I'm making that up, that you could produce now. Is anything tickle you fancy? Sure. I th what we're seeing is interesting is because the live remote stuff isn't working out and with uh, other folks that we work with having live remote issues and the fact that we have a studio with full broadcast capabilities, we're seeing uh, the demand for people to coming to us wanting to record and broadcast from our studios to go going way up. So for example, in October, we'll have four different productions going on from our studio. Um, and that's only been possible because the team there has streamlined their efforts in the studio itself, being able to, to basically set up and break down different productions. So um, this is basically forcing us to become, you know, a, a better well-oiled machine when it comes to running it. I see that continuing post COVID, um, you know, folks, you know, the production quality is higher from a, from a studio. Um, there's not necessarily all the live remote issues that you run into by doing it from a, from a real studio. So that for sure we see continuing on. We hope it does. Yeah. And Sean, do you have any clients or any customers you work with that are planning on using some of your wares for future, even post COVID scenarios and workflows? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole uh, watch party, you know, fan um, enablement is, is, is not going away in, in my opinion. I, I think that totally agree. we will go back to some you know, live events and, and hopefully we can get together in, in large groups. But now there's the ability, wait a minute, there was always a bunch of people that couldn't make, couldn't make it. Um, and this is, opens up new revenue streams. Um, we're working with people, um, you know, we, there's been this concept, okay, well, how do we feel like we're in, actually in the experience well, like I said before, with some of these new technologies, with whether it be WebRTC, which kind of breaks down kind of the old CDN-based distribution model, and then you add things like 5G and things like SRT, and then you layer on top virtual reality headsets. Why can't I be sitting in the stadium, at least virtually, 
and and you know st streaming live events to an installed base of uh, virtual reality headsets. So absolutely, I think um, it's going to be a new world, but I think it's it's really exciting, and we're we're figuring out at a necessity, as you pointed out, a lot of these issues. And so when we exit this into that new world, I think we're going to have a whole lot more, let's call them blended experiences. Sam, we talked earlier about um, the fact that live remote production is like another product for people like you. Uh, it has been for me too. Uh, um, what do you think is going to stick? And are you prepared a year from now when things are back to normal to offer remote as another way of producing and not, not by the way not only for less expensive costs but also for global reach sam 100 percent. we are registering it as a separate revenue line we actually market differently to live production because um it is a different process different team we care about it our analysts care about it our investors care about it and i, I don't think it's going anywhere I think, I think that it's going to have two major effects. There's a lot of hybrid models, right? Sending like small fly packs and then linking them back to a central studio. There's going to be a development of more hybrid models going forward. But I think there's two things. I'm going to step away from the technical for a second. I think there's two business things that are really going to change. The first one is when COVID hit, we in our world specifically we suddenly got thousands of new on-air talent <laughs> athletes right. athletes became hosts musicians became wow. gamers it was fascinating to see because their daily lives which they used to not be able to slot things into just all got screwed up and then now you have these guys um realizing that they can be on air talent from home and where it used to cost me an NBA player $20,000 in fees and travel business class and a suite in a hotel, now I can pay them 5,000 for two hours from home because they're not leaving their house. So that's not going anywhere. They're gonna see this, athletes and musicians are gonna see content as a second revenue stream, whether as appearance fees or owning their own content. So that's, that's really a, um, a, a, a big change that I think we're, we're going to see. And then from a business standpoint, the vast majority of new clients we got picked up in the last six months were brands that are huge spenders in sports. They are brands that suddenly had event dollars reallocated to content. Now, the real what you're starting to see now is, did they get a return of investment? They are normally getting an impression for much lower than they get from a physical activation in a sports arena. Um, but are they getting actual conversion to loyalty, conversion to purchase and ROI on it? Over the next month, I think we're really going to see some of that pan out. And all you're going to see in 2021 when, when sports continues to come back is maybe a more split marketing spend from some of these brands where they put some of it back into sports. But actually, they're going to say, you know what? We had some success in 2020. I'm going to set some of this aside and I'm going to keep it with content. I'm going to keep it with live streaming. I'm going to keep it with gaming. That's the business thing that I think is actually going to stick into 21 because people have seen success from their reallocation of dollars. That's good. That's really good. I also, I like, I like what you said, this whole remote production really enables and puts some of the creative in the athlete or the host's uh, hands. And that's a big, big ginormous change uh, from what it's been. Uh, I guess in theory, any athlete, any host, any talent, any potential talent could now be a host and a producer from their home, which is a double edged sword, by the way. Um, <laughs> true, true. Um, yeah, you know what? We have a couple. Of, we have a few questions. Jonathan Hessing is asking Tyler. I assume he's one of Tyler's engineers from back home. Jonathan Hessing is asking Tyler, "What are some live remote issues you see when done remotely?" I mean, we're talking about how great everything is. We've already addressed latency has been a lot better. Tyler, what are some live remote issues you see when done remotely and not in the studio? Sure, the only, the only one that consistently shows up is if there's any ever an issue with the feed is trying to pinpoint if it's coming from the source or, or cause we usually, we bounce it uh, from the source to our studio and then, you know, through our OTT platforms, it's just pinpointing where that, where, where that originates. Um, and then dealing with our remote crew, uh, it can be challenging too. Uh, time zone wise and, and stuff, for example, for broadcasting something from Australia, 
uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just challenging, I guess, you know, working from afar that way. You kidding me? I got enough yeah. trouble from New York to Green Bay. I can't imagine like, <laughs> like locking <laughs> in with Australia. No, thanks. Yeah. Although I, I have to tell you, having done quite a bit of live remote shows uh, in the past seven, eight months, for me, no matter what you have, you can have a TriCaster on top of a TriCaster on top of a vMix, no matter what you have, um, you're only as good as your remote's Wi-Fi. And you're only as good as the, you know what, I'll say it this way, the technical capabilities of your guest. Because... Celebrities and athletes don't have their PR people with them like they normally would. Easy. And, and we've all done this, I'm sure. Um, you're speaking to someone, maybe it's on a Zoom beforehand, like a pre-call, and you're, you're, oh, did you turn the, oh, you can't hear me? You can't hear me? Did you, did you turn it on? Did you press the link after you put the headset on? Or can you shut the, um, I hear a hum. Is that an air conditioned unit in the background? Or can you shut the blinds because the glare is killing me? Um, but even if you can get through all that, when their Wi-Fi is bad, when the, when the cable modem Wi-Fi is in a den and they're in the kitchen or in the basement, um, <laughs> you're, really, you're really screwed. You're only as good as your participant's Wi-Fi. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and I've sent, and I've sent, uh, and I've sent you know, uh, Wi-Fi's or whatever they're called nowadays. I've sent these out to people as well when it really mattered, but you, you get the point. Uh, on to questions, just because there's a bunch of them. Jody Weaver uh, is asking the group some technical items. Uh, I'll just go for it and someone jump in. Um, uh, is it possible to get universal video video spec for global distribution? The FPS and mono versus two channels seem to be a challenge within certain regions. What is your recommendation? Jody also asks uh, file distribution hints. Uh, anyone want to say something about that? Mono versus two channel. And that's a Sean question if I ever heard yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think yeah. um, it depends what we're talking about. I mean, there's a there's encoding or compress, compression standards, and then there's the distribution standards. I think, the, I don't think, I think the answer is no. I think we can stabilize on a resolution, maybe in a frame rate, possibly, at, at least for a contribution. Um, but as far as, uh, I mean, we've got, H.264, we have HEVC in some places, you've got VP9, we're seeing new emerging standards like AV1 that are being used. Um, and then on the, the transport protocol side, you know, SRT is clearly one of the big winners, but then you've got RISC, you've got things like Zixi, you know, you've got WebRTC. So I don't think there's going to be, unfortunately, um, we're going to have one standard. So I think when people are, are setting up their infrastructure or their, their flow, they really need to be thinking about um, who, they're, who they're interacting with. And, and in addition to that, what we've seen is Microsoft Azure has aligned themselves with, uh, with SRT, yet AWS hasn't. So even within the cloud vendors, we have right. these, these separate camps. Okay, Jody also asked about file distribution. Uh, I mean, we're, we're really talking mostly about live streaming, but uh, what are people using nowadays for file distribution and even asset management? Uh, it's always fun to ask what are my peers are using. Uh, I personally have gone from, uh, from a media silo. I'm not trying to do commercials for anyone because who cares? I've personally gone from a media silo world to now an iconic asset management and file distribution world. Anybody have any other ideas? Uh, this is something I was talking about earlier, talking about creating because of necessity. We created a program called Live Show Creator that we utilize. I'm going to utilize it today for our live show uh, that lets anyone, it's basically like a Google shared doc, but it supports files. So, and it's all in real time. So I have my rundown, I have my shows and I have all my cues and they're all set and the files are all there. And if you have access to it, you can all swap files, you can download all in real time. So there's no waiting for files. You know, you literally are on comms with someone and say, okay, I just uploaded it to the script. That person, wherever they are, uh, can go to that script and go, okay, there it is. They download it and they have it for however they want to manipulate it or use it in their, in their production. It's called Live Show Creator. Google it. This is an ad because it's really awesome. Yeah. 
So, so wait, Aaron, you hooked up with the LiveX guys down by Hudson Yards? That's Corey Banky is my co-founder of Cheesehead TV. He co-founded LiveX. I've known Corey for 25 years. Yeah. Cheesehead TV is incubated yeah, was, inside LiveX. Cool. I was supposed to get a tour and, and, and then COVID And happened. then COVID happened, uh, right? Hey, man, once we open back up, you come on by. It's a lot of fun. All right. Uh, Sam and Tyler, what are you doing for file management nowadays um, and asset management? Sam? Um, I, pretty basic, honestly. Um, very basic. We don't hold much. Um, just the nature of our um, business, it's very transient. Uh, it's project by project. A lot of brands, often we are hired by bigger agencies, which means we have to use their system. Um, so I'd say like 60% of our business is direct to brand. 40% of the time we're being hired by, um, uh, by other agencies. So uh, I wouldn't know the exact ones we use. I'd have to uh, get their tech team to do that. But what I do know is we often have to integrate into others uh, and use their, their pre-existing systems because we don't own any of the content we produce naturally. We're a, we're a white label third party. So we don't have the rights to like keep hold of any of the content that comes through our system. So it's very transient on, on our system, on our basis. Hmm. Yeah, for us, uh, we're using Iconic for everything now. And it's been, uh, actually the virus has been good in that it's given us time to digitize a lot of content that's been on tapes. So for example, we took eight years of, of old archived World Series of Poker content over the summer, digitized it all, threw it all up at Iconic, made it available through our, through our platforms. Um, and uh, it's also been another exercise is we've got content housed all over the place. So we've been centralizing it during the last three or four months. So, yeah. It's nice. You always save stuff for a rainy day. Yeah. Hey, um, <laughs> Totally. Uh, Sean, I think it's time that you, I think you should reapply. I, I should what, sorry? I think you should reapply. The sun is really strong. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week. Hey, um, hey, so let's close this up and talking about where, you know, I'm reading this thing from the brochure, where the puck is going. So esports, but from a production point of view and, um, and sports streaming, from, again, from a production, production workflow, programming point of view, what's on the horizon in the next five minutes? What's on the horizon? Where are we going? What's exciting? Uh, you know, I read an article yesterday about esports and uh, esports daily, whatever it's called, about Europe. Europe is obviously on fire. It always has been, especially west, not east. Um, and, and the different regions are all embracing their esports and their sports programming uh, in different ways. Um, Somebody jump in and tell me what's on the horizon for our, in our industry? What's on the horizon for our profession? What are we excited about? To um, me, it's something that Sean mentioned earlier in regards to the integration of, and this is something we've started to do with our app, uh, where you're gamifying the stream, right? And I'm sure Sam has vast experience here as far as you've got people now collectively, watch parties, what have you, now you gamify that where you're creating new revenue streams that just didn't exist before. So if it's as simple as, okay, what's this next third down call going to be? And you have a way for them to input it on the app and then you can win money, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But they're paying for that service. Now you are literally creating revenue streams where nothing existed. It's literally just a game. Uh, that to me is the way forward, so to speak, where you I'll talk about athletes owning their, their stuff and being able to create from their home it's it opens up so many possibilities for connectivity but also for revenue to me that's the biggest kind of accelerator here huge huge tyler where are we going what's what's on the horizon? what are you excited about in in closing what are you excited about i'm excited Listen. for live remote events to come back and i think uh, <laughs> i think He's all excited to see his players are, without their masks on that too yeah that too <laughs> We get a lot of heat for that. They think that we're the culprit of, uh, of forcing that upon people. Um, no, we're just, we're just playing along. No, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just waiting for live events to come back. It's why most people subscribe to our service. Um, that's what we hear about every day. We want to bring it back as much as people want to see it. And Tyler's excited about the creme brulee French toast at the Aria Buffet. Mm. Uh, buffet. Uh, that's a good no one. buffets that's a good one <laughs> uh, 
Um, Sam, what are you most excited about coming up? What do you forget about the, forget about COVID and remote nah. esports? What's, what's big with esports? Because automation. I, I am a hundred percent all in for automation. Um, and what I I grew up in the sports producing sports, and thankfully I got to produce like some pretty big ones. So there's like an army of statisticians typing away as soon as something happens and that feed comes, but I've also produced high school sports, right? And you, you take gaming, everything is an API. Everything is within the game, all the data, all the stats. Um, and I love it. I love when a publisher has an open API that allows us to automate fantastic graphics, fantastic highlights, and like automation is something that some games, Rocket League, Rocket League is probably my favorite game to produce because the API is so fantastic and you can create some pretty unbelievable graphics out of it, um, completely automated. And I think we're only going to develop more of that as publishers start seeing the benefit, not just from a production standpoint, like how great the graphics can be, how great the highlights and the VT packages can be, but also how they can integrate brands and additional revenue opportunities um, via, via sponsorship, via interactivity right? Not just one way, like automation, what we're peeling at the moment is automation this way, which is game API comes into our production and we create our graphics. What I'm fascinated about is when we get to the point where automation goes the other way, fans affect in-game content, right? And the interactivity leads to choosing camera angles, choosing skins or uniforms, choosing the color of the ball, whatever it might be. That for me is innovation. That's for me something, and like I said, we are a sports and gaming company, so I'm never going to pick one over the other. But that is definitely something that excites me about gaming a lot more than it does about sports, is just the, uh, the opportunity for automation, the opportunity to integrate API into a production suite. That, that's something that I think, Jeff, we're only scratching the surface of, and there's so much room to grow there in the near future. So much. I love that. I love that. Hey, uh, Sean Garner, do me a favor. In sure. closing... Can you, can you say a sentence using the phrase next gen compression technology? <laughs> sure, yeah. So uh, I, I just wanna say one thing before because Sam hit something there. We've been working with, uh, we've had this one to many broadcast type uh, network set up for, for years now. In sports, in, in gaming, it's, we talk about personalization, but personalization up to this point has been, oh, I'm gonna insert an ad that I think is relevant for you. We are talking about remote production. What if I put the, the consumer in the director's chair or the producer's Thousand chair? percent, yes. Let me pick the camera angles, monetize all of the camera angles instead of one person picking it, but let the user, let them, bring in their fantasy football, their Twitter feed, and why can't I build my own channel? That's once we start streaming all this to the cloud and getting ultra low latency networking and a lot of this infrastructure deployed, suddenly this becomes really a really interesting um, aspect. So that's one of the things that we, where the direction we see it's going. Um, as far as compression is concerned, one of the things that um, we've been seeing a lot is, is um, with some of this, um, you know, bigger resolutions, higher frame rates, especially with gaming, um, cloud-based gaming, um, you, you need to, you're, you're, you're streaming more data. Live video just doesn't naturally, um, versus file, you, you can't take five hours to compress one hour of video you need to do it in milliseconds in real time. And so for this, you know, things like AV1 or uh, LCEVC is another uh, protocol or standard that we've been working with. These are, are gonna be critical because they'll enable us um, to start doing some more of these exciting things. It's just really kind of continuing to build out this, this base level infrastructure. So, so companies like everyone who's on the call can make these exciting experiences really happen. Great. Uh, everything we've spoken about today, again, needs to be enabled. So we appreciate uh, all facets of the industry. Uh, hey, uh, thanks very much. Eric, uh, Eric, back to you. Yeah, thanks so much. This has been an outstanding panel. Great discussion that really did a 
good job of mixing the technical side of things with the non-technical and business side of things. I have one last question for Aaron. Aaron, should the Packers have drafted a wide receiver in the first round this year? Why, why, why are you trying to get me mad? Why are you trying to blow me up? <laughs> why, why? You know, like I, I scream about this on YouTube all day. You don't need this here. I'm a, this is my professional voice. I don't, okay. you don't want right. to hear the, the ugly stuff. Come on. Now. All right. Anyway, thanks so much. This, like I said, this has been terrific. Thanks again to Xilinx for sponsoring this panel. Uh, thanks again to Limelight Networks for sponsoring all of streaming media. We at West Connect will be back in about an hour with some tech talks from industry leaders. So I hope to see some of you then. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.